Why are Shenzhen's and New Poor behaving so erratically? They queue for three hours for limited edition AJ sneakers, spritz Gucci perfume over Chanel bags, and clutch the iPhone 14 Pro Max, all while shouldering an average debt of 120,000 yuan. It would take them a year and a half without spending on anything else to pay off. They firmly believe in the adage, money is to be spent, not saved. As they grind away from 9 a.m. to 9 p.m., six days a week, ads show Alaskan salmon leaping from the waters, suggesting that life shouldn't just be a mundane daily grind. As they draw a higher income yet still live in inner cities, ads seduce them with visions of opulent city living. Capitalism, ready to shell out as much as 5 million yuan on a single advertisement, aims to seize their consciousness, reinforcing the ID. You are what you consume. When we mention the term poor, we often envision those living in dire poverty. But in today's society, especially in China, a surge of new poor has emerged, particularly after three years of stringent pandemic controls and an overall economic downturn, major cities like Shenzhen, Guangzhou, Beijing, and Shanghai are witnessing an increasing number of these individuals with limited options. Have you noticed the growing number of new poor in Shenzhen? They have cars and houses, but seemingly no cash on hand. Out of 6 million households in Shenzhen, only 180,000 have assets exceeding 5 million yuan or 688,000 USD, comprising not more than 3%. And a mere 80,000 households possess assets over 10 million yuan, roughly 2% of the total. These individuals appear affluent on the surface, but are mired in debt. Some business owners driving luxury cars can't even produce 10,000 yuan in cash. They rely on credit cards and digital wallets like Alipay for everyday expenses, with some even struggling to refuel their cars. Though they may own their homes, monthly mortgage payments dwarf typical rental costs. The new poor of yesteryear struggled for daily sustenance, whereas today's new poor ponder life in their luxury apartments, wait for discounted vegetables in supermarkets, and debate whether to add an egg to their noodles. Their income is not meager, so where does all their money go? Massive home loans, car loans, and children's education costs, leaving them scraping by. Before the pandemic, I planned to venture into publishing. As I prepared shipments, the outbreak halted everything, leading to stockpiling. I noticed the changing market dynamics. Traditional approaches weren't effective. After injecting personal funds, it still wasn't enough. I mortgaged my house and gradually accrued a massive debt. The financial hole just grew deeper. Haven't you ever thought of giving up your business and returning to a regular job? I once asked my former boss if I could return. He said the company no longer hires anyone over 35. I was passed over. Job hunting at 35 in the current market is incredibly challenging. My name is Xiao Yu. I embarked on my entrepreneurial journey in 2019. The initial months were prosperous, filling me with optimism. However, the onset of the pandemic, multiple quarantines, and several lockdowns disrupted everything. I thought I could weather the storm and emerge victorious after a few months, but three years later, I faced the stark reality of a failed venture. After the three-year pandemic, many anticipated a surge in revenge spending. However, what emerged was a wave of revenge entrepreneurship with fierce internal competition among business owners, leaving me feeling utterly helpless to save on taxes meaning to optimize financial dealings without breaking the law. I meticulously collect even the smallest receipts worth just five yuan. I constantly hunt for the cheapest monthly accounting services just to ensure the company can survive a few months longer. From the initial joy of entrepreneurship to the eventual feelings of impotence, by March 2023, I made the tough decision to deregister my company, bidding farewell to my dream. Subsequently, I tried various jobs to sustain myself. I took off my elegant coat, referencing a symbolic transformation, and worked as a waiter and even a food delivery rider. But these roles never felt right. I often ponder, what job truly suits me? During one of my moments of despair, I stumbled upon an old accounting certificate from years ago. It rekindled memories and aspirations. I decided to dust off my resume and join the massive job-seeking army. Today, my primary focus is to earn, 
acquire new skills, and yes, to lose weight. To enhance my appearance, the immediate goal, to find a suitable job in Shenzhen? Frankly, job hunting seems even more exhausting than the job itself. But besides those who face entrepreneurial failures, among the new poor, there exists a segment who pretends to be successful business owners. Recently, during a visit to Shenzhen, I met an old friend. Our reunion shed light on the reality that many in this city seem to be only pretending to be entrepreneurs. Despite his impressive social media presence suggesting success, the truth was far from glamorous, especially in financial and emotional aspects. Shenzhen is a hub for talents attracting people nationwide, all in search of opportunities. This inevitably means fierce competition, with everyone giving their utmost. In my eyes, Shenzhen appears, half are hardworking employees, the other half, passionate entrepreneurs. In reality, almost everyone's engrossed in relentless work, with very few experiencing genuine ease. My friend was enthusiastic, speaking animatedly about various projects, opportunities, advancements, and the developments in the Greater Bay Area. He dropped buzzwords like venture capital, incubation equity, and market valuation exuding confidence. But as I listened, I wondered how many of these ambitious plans were really bringing him stable revenues. Still, I couldn't bring myself to question him. As we shared late-night snacks, he dominated the conversation. When the bill arrived, he hesitated, asking me to cover it, as he'd forgotten his other phone with the payment app. Without a second thought, I paid. Yet, I couldn't help but notice the change in his expression. This friend, not yet 40, specialized in marketing research, resource integration, and leveraging growth. He's impressively packaged himself with an array of prestigious titles. Yet, despite years of effort, financial success eluded him. Given the current challenging economic climate, it seemed he was continuously pep-talking himself, and his social circle is filled with similar personalities. Many in Shenzhen are in the same predicament, appearing glamorous on the surface but grappling with profound challenges underneath. In the constantly lit 24-hour bookstores of Shenzhen today, a rising number of unemployed middle-class professionals can be found pretending to be at work. Similar spots like Starbucks and McDonald's are already saturated with similar individuals, leaving no room for newcomers. Through this act, they cling to the last shreds of their dignity. Along with economic downturns and job losses comes the swift decline of personal and family assets. Astoundingly, over 70% of these middle-class family assets are tied up in real estate. Even a minor tremor in the property market can determine the fate of these households. For instance, if the value of an 8 million yuan property in Shenzhen drops by 20%, a homeowner with a 2 million yuan equity and a 6 million yuan loan would see their net assets shrink dramatically. The economic vulnerability finds these laid-off middle-aged professionals slipping out in the stillness of the night to drive their yet-to-be-paid-for Mercedes-Benz E200Ls to earn money on Didi, a Chinese ride-sharing platform. In the first half of this year, the number of DD drivers in Shenzhen doubled, but the number of passengers dropped by half. The latest statistics published by China International Capital Corporation Limited CICC, in early 2023 reveal that out of the income brackets in China, only 700,000 individuals earn over 20,000 yuan per month. These figures notably exclude the massive corrupt bureaucracy within the Chinese Communist Party. A decade ago, the mainland's middle class population exceeded 10 million, with an average investable asset of 1.33 million yuan. Fast forward to the present, and this group has almost vanished. The term middle class originates from Western sociology, representing a societal stratum. The Pew Research Center's analysis up to 2021 suggests that roughly 50% of Americans belong to the middle class. Although this is a significant drop from 61% in 1971, the middle class remains the backbone of American society, with their annual incomes ranging between $38,000 and $114,000 in 2023. In mainland China, though there are families with middle class incomes, it's perhaps an overstatement to label them as a distinct social class. According to a white paper jointly released by Forbes China and Credit Ease Wealth in March 2013, Affluent classes in China, then totaling over 10.26 million people, comprised just 0.7% of the 1.4 billion population. This demographic, primarily high-level white-collar professionals, has seen a drastic decrease within a decade, a transformation that is profoundly thought-provoking. One of the most renowned contemporary sociologists and philosophers, Polish scholar Zygmunt Bauman, 
in his book Work, Consumerism, and the New Poor, highlights that while every society has its impoverished, the root causes, societal perspectives, and solutions differ. Bauman identifies two societal stages from the onset of industrialization to today, the producer society and the consumer society. In the producer society phase, individuals were indoctrinated with a work ethic, believing that not working was sinful. Here, the impoverished were synonymous with the unemployed. Driven by economic, moral, or enforced motivations, many poor were compelled to take factory jobs, even if the wages barely sustained a minimal living standard. Starting in the 1970s, Western nations gradually transitioned from a producer society to a consumer society, where consumption supplanted work, and consumer aesthetics replaced the traditional work ethic, emerging as the dominant societal value. In this consumer-driven era, the impoverished are no longer merely the unemployed, but those who do not consume. These individuals find themselves unable to seize opportunities, make choices, or fulfill fundamental societal roles, and thus are sidelined from both standard and affluent lifestyles. Upon entering the producer society, the indigent were redefined as a reserve army of labor, equating them with unemployment and destitution. However, they remained valuable. The affluent pushed them into factories, coercing them to work, whether through moral obligations, economic incentives, or outright force, aiming to exploit their labor. As long as they had jobs, they felt a sense of dignity. But in the consumer society, the impoverished evolved into non-consumers. Modern economies no longer demand vast labor forces, and whether the destitute participate in production or not has little impact on productivity or capital profit. From the capitalist perspective, producers are temporary, replaceable, and disposable. Crucially, if an individual does not consume, they are deemed valueless. For the first time in history, the impoverished became entirely redundant. The poor in the consumer society became superfluous and unwanted, contributing not to societal wealth, but societal burden. Unlike the Western experience, contemporary China's economic evolution is a concentrated and extreme case within a brief time frame. Highlighting this transformation, footage from a 220-minute documentary shot by Italian director Michelangelo Antonioni in the 1970s depicted the Mao era, showcasing an agriculturally driven China that had not yet embarked on industrialization. Following the Cultural Revolution, the long-shut doors of communist China gradually opened, especially after its 2001 entry into the World Trade Organization. With Western markets welcoming China and the inflow of vast foreign capital, China capitalized on its cheap labor, becoming the world's factory. Propelled by export growth, investments and consumption flourished. Amid rapid economic advancement, many reaped the era's dividends. Whether it was manufacturing, real estate, foreign trade, e-commerce, or online gaming, capitalizing on any sector's momentum could lead to rapid wealth accumulation or even overnight riches. Using the words of Lei Jun, founder of Chinese electronics company Xiaomi, when standing at the forefront of an industry, even pigs can fly. Economic prosperity usually translates to increasing corporate profits, sales, and cash flow, maximizing the utility of existing capacities. This promotes higher profit forecasts and corporate confidence, inspiring businesses to enhance fixed investments. Naturally, further economic growth relies on stimulating consumer purchases. As wealth surged within China, its burgeoning middle class developed an insatiable appetite for consumption. Psychologist Gustave Le Bon's seminal work, The Crowd, a study of the popular mind, posits, quote, whoever can supply them with illusions is easily their master. The rise of consumerism in China transformed branded commodities into emblems of status and identity. How else would one prove their love for gourmet delights if not by dining at Michelin-starred restaurants, or demonstrate their discipline without gym memberships, or their undying love without gifting diamond rings? When consumerism becomes the collective consciousness, individual critical thinking is often overwhelmed. As many Chinese accustom themselves to seek validation through consumption and gauge others by the same metric, a competitive culture of flaunting began to dominate, with everyone trying to one-up each other. Their optimism for the future, blinded by short-term affluence, became reckless. Many, earning annual revenues of 600,000 yuan, just over 8,000 US dollars, felt emboldened to borrow millions for buying houses and luxury cars, entrusting their children to elite schools and enabling their wives to cease working. A common sentiment was that ascending to the wealthy class was inevitable and the present consumption was merely an anticipation of their future prosperity. 
However, the sudden advent of the COVID-19 pandemic, compounded by Chinese President Xi Jinping's economic policies, led to the withdrawal of foreign investments, closure of private enterprises, and a general economic downturn. The demographic dividend vanished, and the opportunities for lucrative investments dwindled. The once high-flying pigs found themselves grounded. The false prosperity, built on myopic expectations and borrowed consumption, began to burst like bubbles. Drawing a parallel with America's socioeconomic structure, a bell-shaped distribution where the very wealthy and very poor occupy the extremes, communist China's economic structure resembles the curve of a hockey stick. Barring the opulent and corrupt communist elite, the vast majority of the population dwells in poverty, including the newly defined neo-poor. Unlike America's vast middle class comprising professionals from diverse sectors, China's genuine middle class income group primarily consists of the vast corrupt bureaucratic apparatus of the Chinese Communist Party. In essence, this group, uninvolved in genuine production, thrives parasitically on China's economic body, funded by tax-paying citizens. The actual professionals and experts either align themselves with the Chinese Communist Party, relocate abroad, or struggle as the neo-poor within the nation's borders. It's hard to articulate my current state, the weight of depression, the engulfing hopelessness. I reminisce about the times when I had capital, no debt, and daily earnings in thousands. Today, entangled in debt and frequent loan repayments, life battling severe depression, the once euphoric highs elude me, sleep-deprived nights, an empty marriage, and a stalled career. Everything feels like a colossal failure. A looming darkness seems to obscure any glimpse of a brighter future.